Thank you very much. I'm not sure I recognize anyone in that introduction, but thank you. Uh, I was thinking uh, on the way, uh, walking down here in this beautiful day, um, what cardiology was like when I started fellowship almost 39 years ago and the tools we had. We had EKGs. Uh, there was something brand new called echocardiography, which has just started to be done. Thanks to Melvin Judkins and his work, we had coronary angiography. And uh, everyone had this strange thing uh, around their necks that nobody knows how to use anymore called a stethoscope. And uh, those are the tools we had. Anything that had to be fixed had to be fixed with, uh, with surgery, with open chest surgery. And so all of the technology we're going to talk about today um, is, is new in my career and has been exciting to watch. The one thing that has not changed is the most uh, basic tool that we have is still the best tool, and that's the history and physical and uh, the mind that goes along with it to be able to interpret it. And that's what we try to teach our fellows. And they love all the technology, but it still goes back to talking to the patient. So we're going to talk about uh, something new in, in treatment of hyperlipidemia, a, a new medication for that. We'll talk about some of the really esoteric uh, treatment of coronary artery disease, uh, some, some uh, about arrhythmia, valve disease, and then adult congenital heart disease. Um, and then we'll have time for some questions. We've known for a long time that cholesterol is important in, uh, in uh, heart disease. And, this is a, an old slide with old data, uh, but it's still true that it shows that there's a, uh, a, a log uh, linear relationship between LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol, and the risk of heart disease. And so the higher LDL goes, uh, the higher the risk. You can see the, the, um, the 1.0, the, in other words, sort of baseline risk, is at an LDL of 40. And our current recommendations are, if you have heart disease, we want the LDL be, uh, to be below 70. I'm not sure if there is such a thing as too low in LDL, but basically, uh, the lower the better. So the drugs we've had for the last uh, 15 uh, years or so are, are the statins. And statins are still the number one recommended drug to be used for cholesterol. They can lower cholesterol with the weak statins, uh, 20 to 30 percent, with the strong statins, up to uh, 50 or 60 percent, uh, at least in combination with, with uh, azetamibe. Um, and that translates into better, better, uh, um, or fewer uh, bad events that patients have, fewer heart attacks, fewer strokes. The trouble with statins is a lot of people can't take them. There, there's a large number of people that get myalgias with statins and other side effects. And uh, there's, a, there's so much written in the internet about how bad they are that a lot of people just won't take them. So what do we do with people who either can't take statins or they just aren't effective enough? Well, the low, um, we recently discovered uh, that, that there's a, an important enzyme called uh, PCSK9. And I'm not going to read that out because uh, there's a reason they abbreviate it. You can see the, the whole name there. But it's an enzyme that's uh, encoded to the PCSK9 gene and affects the LDL receptors. And basically, it, it prevents the receptors from getting rid of LDL cholesterol. And so the, they develop drugs to, uh, to try to inhibit that, that enzyme. And by inhibiting it, um, they, uh, they can inactivate it and dramatically increase, uh, dramatically increase the receptors, which then decreases serum LDL. Um, these are monoclonal antibodies and they're created with technology that, that was not available, again, when I started fellowship. Acting alone, they, they're effective in lowering LDL by about 50%. Um, if you combine them with statins, you can get LDL lowering of up to 70%. And so they're, they're a, a very powerful drug. Um, they have to be given subcutaneously. There are two of them currently on the market, um, uh, Rapatha and Proluent. Um, and uh, they both are, uh, both are every two week uh, medications. <coughs> um, do they work? Uh, there's a big, there have been a couple of big trials. First was the Odyssey trial comparing uh, um, Alirocumab, uh, which is uh, one of those two medicines, 
against uh, standard therapy, which includes statins. And what they found was the outcomes were about the same. I mean, there was no big advantage. Importantly, there was no big disadvantage. There were no bad side effects that were not, uh, th that had not been anticipated. And when they when they looked at the uh, when they looked at the events uh, post hoc, um, they there actually probably was an advantage in fewer cardiovascular events, and so this allowed these these uh, drugs to come to market. Um, the the Osler trial was a was a long term look at PCSK9, and what they found is uh, they had a 61 percent reduction in LDL, which is great a 50% reduction in events, which was really great. The problem was there were a few more neurocognitive effects in the treatment group than in the placebo group. We don't know if this is real or not. Uh, these patients were seeing their doctors so frequently they had more time to complain about these things. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a worry, and, and I think fewer or future, uh, future uh, studies are going to be needed to show whether whether these really should be used uh, widely uh, or not. Um, the big thing about these drugs is they're, they're incredibly expensive compared to dieting and compared to statins. Uh, the average cost is about 15,000 per year for these drugs. And uh, subsequently, they're almost impossible to get insurance companies to approve. I think of all the people I've tried, I have like two or three patients that have actually been approved by the insurance company. One of the reps told me yesterday they decreased the cost by 60%, his company did. Um, I'll believe that when I see it. At 60% reduction, it's still way more expensive than, than what we have, uh, but they are effective. So what, what do we do now for high, high cholesterol in people that need, that really need dramatic reduction? In other words, this is secondary prevention. People with, with, uh, that have had, uh, that have had uh, acute coronary syndromes. We start everybody with statins. If they can't tolerate the statin or if their LDL cholesterol doesn't drop uh, low enough, then uh, we usually add uh, azetamibe, uh, zetia. If they're still not effective, then uh, we could consider uh, adding one of these uh, newer agents. So what about the people who didn't get prevented early enough and have horrible complex coronary disease? The, these are people that uh, almost always either uh, would die or, or would require uh, high-risk uh, bypass surgery. Patients with unprotected left main coronary disease or patients who have disease in their one last vessel, everything else is occluded. People with really poor heart function or shock or other comorbidities. Um, now we're able to treat these patients with non-surgical techniques uh, with the use of a couple of techniques. This is one such patient. Uh, this is a patient uh, that had, uh, has disease of the left main that involves both branches uh, just beyond the left main. And, uh, um, was turned down. Uh, was turned down for surgery. Um, another another lesion uh, further down. Whoops, sorry. Uh, further down in in the uh, in the LED as well. So the CT surgeon was consulted. Uh, uh, deemed to be too high risk because of uh, terrible liver disease and uh, and terribly depressed left ventricular function. And so after a long discussion, decided to proceed with, with, uh, with PCI. And to do this, we, we decided to use uh, an impella support. And what this is is a, is a pump that's inserted through the, uh, through, the femoral, whoops, through the femoral vein, or the femoral artery, and, uh, and then goes across the aortic valve. Let's see if we can get this. I don't know if this is going to play or not. Oh, this is not, this is not going to play. But anyway, the indications for, for it are patients with shock that come in or uh, patients with low car, car, uh, cardiac output syndrome. In this case, high-risk uh, high PCI. And so that you can see the pump with the pigtail that's, uh, that's pumping. And uh, this is a little, uh, what we call a rotoblader, a little uh, drill that uh, drilled through the calcium in that artery to allow a stent to be placed. Uh, stents were then positioned in both arteries and uh, simultaneously inflated. 
<clears throat> and uh, afterwards, uh, everything, everything looked good. More importantly, uh, long term, uh, the function uh, beforehand had been very poor and afterwards improved significantly. So this is a patient that avoided surgery and, and uh, improved dramatically with, uh, with this advanced technology. We'll move on to arrhythmias, advances in, in cardiac electrophysiology. I, again, when I was a fellow, electrophysiology was uh, EKGs, and uh, there were a few antiarrhythmic drugs out that uh, were, were of questionable efficacy. And so we're going to talk about some of the things now uh, that uh, where, where we've evolved to in, in this field. Um, Pacer lead fractures, pacemakers and, and implantable defibrillators are wonderful life-saving uh, life devices and are fantastic until they go bad. When leads uh, fracture, or, or more importantly, if, uh, when leads become infected, it's, it's a horrible problem. Um, once a foreign body uh, in the body gets infected, everything has to come out to treat the infection. The trouble is the, uh, the leads, once they've been in there for a while, um, tend to fibrose into place. Now, the whole lead isn't fibrosed in place, but where they rub against, uh, uh, rub against uh, vessels or, uh, or, or around bends, uh, they tend to fibrose into place. And if you just yank on them, uh, those, those uh, uh, vessels or the, or the right atrium can tear. You can see this is a picture of a of a of a obviously a, an autopsy specimen of a of a right atrium, and you can see how thin it is. You can see right through it, and so it's not something you you want to just uh, use brute force to get these uh, leads out. So how how do they get them out? Well, they've developed our our is something called a, a laser sheath. Um, it's a it's a round sheath with uh, with uh, circumferential uh, little laser dots, and uh, this can be advanced uh, over the over the old lead. The lead is cut, and they slide it down over the lead. And when they come to obstructive things, they'll just laze through that tissue uh, quickly. It works really well, except uh, if it's been in there so long that it's calcified, it can't really laze through calcification. And sometimes they even have to open the chest for those for those patients. And so this is another just illustration of how it's done. Uh, our uh, this is done uh, jointly with a with a cardiac electrophysiologist and a cardiac surgeon uh, for the rare cases where even with this uh, the uh, the SVC or the right atrium can be torn and emergency surgery is needed. Atrial fibrillation, uh, and there's probably a significant people in this room that, that have had atrial fibrillation. It's the, it's the most common uh, uh, arrhythmia we have, or that we see, and it, it, uh, goes up, uh, it goes up dramatically with age. Current treatments for atrial fibrillation, everyone needs to be anticoagulated, and, um, and uh, um, there are newer anticoagulants that we won't talk about today, but th that, that's something brand new. Warfarin has been around uh, since the 1950s, but, uh, but the newer drugs uh, actually work very well. Um, but there is another alternative to anticoagulation. We'll talk about that in, in a minute. Um, in terms of maintenance of sinus rhythm, I won't go into this a lot, but. Uh, um, uh, radiofrequency ablation has become kind of the mainstay of this if medications uh, fail. Atrial fibrillation, we know is, uh, the risk of stroke is, is significant. Uh, about 5 million people currently have atrial fibrillation. As the population ages, uh, by 2050, it's estimated that 12 million people will have atrial fibrillation in the country. And uh, about uh, um, about one in five uh, people end up stro having strokes if they aren't treated, um, and uh, about half of those suffer a second stroke if they're not treated. And so anticoagulation or prevention of stroke is important. The trouble is uh, not, uh, the treatment is, is, not, uh, is not widely uh, given to people. About half the people are on appropriate anticoagulant therapy even if they're on therapy, they, they may not be uh, therapeutic. 
Um, there are different uh, scales to try to estimate uh, uh, risk of stroke uh, versus risk of bleeding. Um, one of the issues with that is that a lot of these overlap. And so if you have high blood pressure, you're at risk of both stroke and bleeding. Uh, if, and if you're older, you have a, a risk of both stroke and bleeding. And so anticoagulants, while they do prevent strokes, they also cause bleeding, and it's, it's, it's a trade-off. One, uh, one alternative is to, is to try to exclude the place where most strokes, about 90% of strokes, 90 plus percent of strokes occur in the left atrial appendage. This little ear off the left atrium that uh, is, uh, is uh, quiescent. And you can see it here and, and uh, I'm not seeing this very well, but uh, in cross section up here. And so, uh, this, uh, so the thought goes, maybe if we can prevent clots from occurring in that left atrial appendage, we can, we can prevent uh, 90 or so percent of the strokes that, that happen. And um, this, again, is just looking at uh, this little pouch off the left atrium uh, where blood pools and, and clots form. Uh, can, we, can we do something about that? So one of the things that's been developed is, in fact, the only one currently approved uh, for the FDA for non-surgical use is this, uh, is this device called a watchman. Uh, this goes in over a catheter and uh, screws on and can be unscrewed once it's in place. So uh, our, our colleagues go in uh, through, the, through the inferior vena cava, make a transeptal uh, puncture across the interatrial septum, and uh, insert this uh, into, the, into the appendage where it, where it sticks in there with these prongs. Here's another view. This is put in under transesophageal echo guidance. And uh, once it's in there, over time, uh, it, uh, it uh, gets new endothelium uh, formed over it. And so uh, nine months after implant, you can see what it looks like. Um, so how good is this thing? Uh, there have been a couple of, of trials looking at this. <clears throat> the uh, PROTECT trial looked at, at uh, standard therapy, which is, uh, which is warfarin versus the device. And the risk of, uh, of either stroke or bleeding was about the same in, in both arms. Uh, maybe a slight preference for, for, uh, for the device. Um, you've looked at five-year outcomes comparing everything up and down. <clears throat> um, they were about the same overall. The big advantage to the device is uh, fewer hemorrhagic strokes because they're not taking anticoagulants. And so this, is, this has become a, actually a, <clears throat> a standard therapy for people who, excuse me, can't or won't take uh, anticoagulants. Ventricular tachycardia <clears throat> is something that uh, is obviously life-threatening, and um, up until the <clears throat> up until the mid 1980s, we didn't have any good treatment for it. We tried a lot of, of drugs that didn't seem to work very well until finally implantable defibrillators came out in the mid 1980s, and that's been the standard therapy um, in the subsequent 35 years. Now there, there, there are more options, and, and particularly uh, ablation for, uh, for ventricular tachycardia. And so what, what they'll do is they'll go in with a, with a catheter and a 3D mapping system and uh, induce the arrhythmia, and then they can, using uh, the computer assigns colors to the way that this activates, and they can tell where that focus is coming from. Then they'll go in with a, with a catheter and apply radio frequency energy, which is sort of like microwave energy, and uh, <clears throat> burn the spots that are, that are causing the tachycardia. And uh, that actually works pretty well. It works really well if the, if the focus is on the inside of the heart, the endocardium, and uh, particularly in the outflow tracts, and, and that's, that's been around for a while. What's, what's tougher is when it's on the outside of the heart, uh, the, the epicardium. And so to get that without surgery, what they'll do is they'll actually uh, go, th go through the skin um, and uh, with a little needle enter the pericardium uh, th uh, through the skin and then advance the little catheter uh, along, the, along the pericardial space till they find the spot that they've mapped out and then, then they can ablate it. And uh, 
this is kind of a long, tedious thing, and obviously is dangerous since they're puncturing the pericardium from the outside, but is actually quite effective uh, um, in patients with where, where their uh, focus of arrhythmia is, is in that unusual spot. <clears throat> One of the biggest problems in, in clinical medicine is, is intermittent arrhythmias, where, we, where people have, have symptoms or they, or they pass out or have palpitations, and we don't know what's causing it. And what we love to do is catch one of these episodes during, with an EKG. Um, and so what are, what are the options uh, for, for arrhythmia detection? For years, what we had was, were Holter monitors, where you'd put electrodes on and wire them into a little device that they wore around. But uh, this field is really exploding. So the, the uh, fairly simple thing is that same kind of Holter monitor, but without wires. So this, this is a self-contained patch, and this is just one company, the Zio patch. And uh, this can be worn for up to 14 days. It stores that much data. And then, uh, and then all the data is stored in electronically in there. You can take it out and analyze it and see what's going on. It's, not, it, it's great. It's not yet real time. And they're developing real time. Um, <clears throat> another device, this is, uh, this is de uh, developed by a layperson called the Cardia app. And there are a couple others that are similar. And this is something that you can glue on the back of your phone or just carry around with you. It connects by Bluetooth to your smartphone. And, uh, and you can, uh, it'll do an EKG by just uh, lead one EKG by putting your fingers on it. It's about, a, it's about $200. It's about $100 for the app and about $100 for the device. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure they'll get cheaper o over time. Um, <clears throat> one downside of this, uh, one of my uh, relatives had one of these and went to their doctor. And the doctor said, oh, you've had atrial fibrillation. And she goes, wait a minute. And she looked at the date, and she had been to a party and was letting a lot of her friends use it. <laughs> and so one of her friends had atrial fibrillation. They, <laughs> they don't know which one. <laughs> um, and, and even newer devices are uh, some of the smart watches, and particularly the Apple Watch uh, has, uh, has a uh, a function that you can use for uh, doing an EKG uh, using this, this, and this is getting uh, kind of this can be stored or or emailed to your doctor or, or whatever, and and uh, I, I think in the future probably most arrhythmias will be will be monitored in in this way. Percutaneous valve therapies. We talked about this a little bit during our during our uh, symposium yesterday. This is really becoming mainstream now. For the aortic valve, um, <clears throat> uh, for, for aortic stenosis, it's really the treatment of choice in patients that are at least intermediate risk for, for surgery. Um, aortic stenosis is, a, is a primarily an, a, a disease of, of older people as the valve calcifies and just won't open anymore. The, the issue is the once symptoms occur, it's, uh, it's extremely ominous. So if you have severe aortic stenosis and the symptoms of heart failure, um, you're, uh, the average survival is, is two years, which is worse than a lot of cancers. Um, the, the good news is there, there's treatment for it. And so in patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, we do uh, risk assessments. And uh, that tells us, uh, are the patients uh, um, low risk? Uh, um, intermediate or high risk for, for surgery. These risk assessments are not perfect because they don't take into account liver disease, they don't take into account frailty and other things, but it's about the best thing, uh, best thing we have currently. Um, in patients that are at least intermediate to high risk, then trans, uh, transcatheter valves have been uh, the treatment, of, uh, have really been, been the treatment of choice. And these, are, these are, uh, come through the femoral artery, um, they're crimped tightly around a balloon. When the balloon is inflated, the, the valve sticks into place and, and begins working. Um, the, the technology has evolved. The, uh, originally, when the valves got approved, when we started using them about five years ago, the, the, they were large uh, bore catheters. Now we're down to about 14 French, which is still big, but 
but uh, is doable in, in almost everybody uh, with the size of femoral arteries that we all have. There's a wide var variety of sizes. And uh, in, in looking at uh, in looking in intermediate uh, risk patients, um, all-cause mortality or stroke, uh, comparing surgery with, with uh, the transcutaneous valves, uh, they're, they're essentially the same. The difference is uh, most of our percutaneous valve patients go home the following day, and they're up walking the same day and go home the following day, and so recovery is, is much easier. Treatment for mitral valve is tougher just because it's a more complicated, uh, it's a more complicated uh, um, problem. There are several things that can go wrong with the mitral valve that can make it leak, but they can be boiled down to really one of two things. Either there's something wrong with the valve itself, uh, it, it prolapses or it's got infected and has a hole in it or one of the cords is torn, and that's what we call degenerative mitral regurgitation, and, and then it'll leak. The other problem is, uh, is uh, not the valve's fault, it's the ventricle's fault. When the ventricle dilates, uh, this ring uh, enlarges, uh, the, the papillary muscles will pull apart and, and the leaflets just can't get back together. And uh, um, for forever, the only treatment for this has been surgical, either replacing the valve or, or repairing it. There are several techniques now to try to, uh, to try to fix the valve. The first one that came around was the treatment of mitral stenosis uh, uh, caused by rheumatic heart disease, a disease we almost never see anymore. We used to do this procedure a lot. I think we've done, we do maybe a couple of a year now just because we don't see much rheumatic disease. But this is where a balloon is taken across the inner atrial septum and uh, put across the valve, inflated, and, and cracks the valve open. Uh, crude, but it, it but it tends to work. Um, for regurgitation, now there there's some novel things, and and one of the most novel is this mitra clip. And the the theory is if you can if you here here it is open. If you can close this and trap uh, uh, trap the leaflets between, get one uh, part of the anterior leaflet and part of the posterior leaflet, and and clip those together, then the valve won't leak. And uh, believe it or not, it actually works. And so again, it's, it's done through the inferior vena cava, transeptal uh, puncture is made, uh, this delivery system uh, um, puts the valve right, uh, or puts the clip right above the valve when, when by echo guidance we're, we're comfortable it's in the right place, it's, it's pushed down into the ventricle, opened up, brought back, and, and the valve is, is clipped. And, and uh, this is just uh, one of our cases here showing uh, where there are two clips. Uh, and sometimes the, the amount of regurgitation is so much that you need two clips side by side. Um, and then this, sh this shows uh, the clip in place uh, holding the two uh, sides of the valve together. Um, it actually, uh, in, in studies, showed that it uh, it, uh, it works pretty well. In this, in this pilot study, it showed that uh, it didn't work 100% of the time, but most patients improved quite a bit. And uh, most importantly, in the pilot study, they showed that if it doesn't work, surgery is still an option. But most patients improved their functional class, their quality of life. Um, uh, more recent or bigger trials and more recent trials uh, actually randomized uh, them to uh, to surgery versus uh, the the device, and what they saw is both groups. Uh, the surgery group was probably slightly better uh, in in terms of uh, of uh, uh, MR reduction and and so on. But in terms of of uh, symptoms, uh, the clip was was almost as good. And here's, here's a slide on symptoms showing that in the uh, device group, 97% uh, uh, of the patients were in class one or two uh, um, after, uh, after the device was implanted, and that's it at one year. So uh, even though it's not as good as surgery, it, it's in patients that are very high risk for surgery, it's, I think, a great alternative. 
Other, uh, this is just an example. This is someone with a prosthetic valve, which you can see here that the prosthetic valve went ba bad. They're high risk for surgery, and, and so in, instead, of, instead of going ahead and having uh, um, another open heart surgery, this is the Edwards valve that we use for, for the aortic valve, the, the TAVR valve that we came through the inferior vena cava, went across the diseased uh, uh, prosthetic mitral valve and put it in there. Uh, we did another one of these yesterday morning and they, they seem to work quite well as an alternative to surgery. Again, if the patient is healthy enough to have surgery, I think that's still better. Uh, this is still in, in its infancy, but in patients like this that are very high risk and would probably not survive an open surgery, um, it's, I think, a decent alternative. And this just shows it uh, in place. Um, newer, newer devices that are not yet FDA approved, uh, we will probably be uh, starting a trial on this here, part of a, part of a worldwide trial. Uh, the, the idea is that uh, the, the coronary sinus runs along the, runs along the outside of the mitral ring, uh, at least it's very close. And so the idea is you can take this device in and, uh, and then tighten it up, it'll crimp that ring uh, bring the leaflets closer together and help them function better. Uh, in, in pilot trials, it, it seems to work okay, but um, we'll see. It's uh, how, how useful it's going to be long term, we don't know yet. Um, there are other, uh, other kind of experimental devices that have not gotten off the ground yet. Uh, the idea of putting in uh, sutures percutaneously um, or uh, actually completely replacing the valve like we do with the aortic valve. The mitral valve is so much more complex. Uh, a lot of designs have been made. None of them have really worked well yet. Um, somebody smart will figure out a way to do this. We'll talk then a, a little bit about percutaneous treatment of adult congenital heart disease. Adult congenital heart disease is a real, uh, it's kind of a, a problem that we created ourselves. The pediatric cardiologists have gotten so good and the pediatric uh, heart surgeons have, have become so good that uh, these, these kids that would die before now are, be, are becoming adults. And so we've got a large group of people who are now adults that have these complicated, complex anatomies that uh, most adult cardiologists don't know how to take care of. And so we have specialists for this, and we're fortunate to have one here. Um, and uh, there are a variety of ways that we can, that we can treat these. The simplest uh, things to treat are, uh, are, the, are the holes in the heart, the uh, ASDs, uh, patent foramen ovale, and so on. The, uh, the more complex are valves that have gone bad, and and uh, other more complex things. <clears throat> the most common uh, form of atrial septal defect is the secundum, uh, which is failure of closure of the flap uh, that usually closes at, at birth. And uh, there are a variety of devices that have been devised uh, to do this. This is one of them, the Amplatzer. Um, there's another one uh, called the Gore, Gore Septal, and, and this is the Gore Helix. And basically, they all work the same way. You come up from the inferior vena cava, you uh, uh, cross the ASD or the PFO, put one side of this uh, sandwich on the left atrial side, the other side on the right atrial side. When you're happy with the way they're opposed and they're sticking together, then you uh, unscrew the attachment, pull everything out and uh, they're, uh, they're left with the device. This shows uh, an echo picture of, uh, of a device going in as it's uh, sort of sandwiched across the septum there. Again, we use echo with the, with the color and so on to make sure that, uh, we, that we know exactly how big it is and, uh, and how we're closing them. There are also devices that we can use to treat other leaks. Uh, uh, um, uh, PDAs, uh, perivalvular leaks in patients who have had surgery and things like that. And uh, this keeps our uh, structural cardiologists busy. So that's a real quick run through sort of where, 
where cardiology is. Uh, we've left out a lot of things like advancement in heart failure with transplants and things like that, but it's, uh, it's been fun to see the development of technology. We can, it's really rewarding to see patients get better when we can apply it in the right way. Um, but what I said earlier hasn't changed. It's still the basics of take care, taking care of patients, talking to patients, and, and uh, getting a good history. Uh, and none of these technologies can take the place of those basics. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Juicy. We have uh, some time for questions. Hands. Thanks for that lecture, Dr. Jutsi. Uh, I know patients sometimes will not tolerate stents. One of the things I've tried to do is reduce the uh, frequency of it. And I've, I've had a patient and I put her on a Torvastatin. She couldn't tolerate any stents, but she could tolerate a Torvastatin, I think about 20 milligrams once a week. I know it's a dramatic uh, drop in her lipids. It's within normal. Uh, have you heard of that kind of practice? And is that actually effective? I'm wondering if anyone's actually studied how effective that would be yeah, that, it's actually a really stent. good, uh, <clears throat> a really good point. There, there are a variety of things that can be done to try to uh, get people to tolerate statins. Um, in some patients, it's it's in their minds, and and probably nothing will help, and they, you know, they have it. But in people that really have have reactions, then less less frequent. Uh, um, I, I think the longer acting statins are probably better if you're going to do that, and so atorvastatin or or rosuvastatin are probably are probably the the best drugs to use for that. But every other day or even less frequent uh, is better than not taking anything. Okay. Uh, an old therapy, E E C E, you know, leg squeezers for heart failure. Right. Um, what's the latest on that, or is it still being used? What do you think? Yeah, what that is, is it's, uh, for those of you who are not acquainted with it, the uh, ECP or, uh, um, is counterpulsation. And so the, the legs are, are uh, surrounded with this uh, device. It's like a blood pressure cuff that, that uh, envelops both legs, and then it's attached to an EKG and, and uh, timed. And so it, it's sort of like a balloon pump uh, externally on the legs. And it actually is, is pretty effective for, for uh, angina in people that are not candidates for, for angioplasty or bypass surgery or who have failed medical therapy. There may be some benefit in heart failure, although that is not it. Um, it it's not widely used simply because it's cumbersome, and, and uh, um, but in, in patients that are refractory to everything else, I, I think it still has some use. Do those that have micro clips need to be on continuous anticoagulants? Uh, do patients with mitral clips need to be on continuous anticoagulation? They're, they're, they usually have to be anticoagulated for a short time, unless they have a, a lot of them have atrial fibrillation as well because of the enlarged left atrium involved with their mitral valve disease, and so. The, one, the ones that have atrial fibrillation do need to continue. We actually have a couple of patients that have gotten both a mitral clip and a watchman device to, to plug up the appendage. Question about the mitral clip again. Um, yeah. What's the incidence of it embolizing, breaking off, and then embolizing, and then what do you do with that? It, 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 yeah, what's the incident? It's actually pretty rare. Um, what the way it's put in, it's done under under transesophageal echo guidance, and so that when, once the clip is attached to the to the leaflets, it's still connected to the delivery device, and so we'll we'll wait for quite a while and analyze everything, and then uh, even after we let it go, it's attached by a string, uh, and it's not totally we haven't totally uh, uh, are happy with it until we pull that string out as well. And so the, the incidence of embolization, it, it does happen, but it's actually quite rare. What, what sometimes happens and, and is rare is it'll come off one of the leaflets. And uh, so it'll still be attached, but it's not doing the job it needs to be because it's, it's, not, it's, you know, it's not connecting the two leaflets. And uh, that's not a dangerous thing you can go in and, and uh, 
and put another clip and, and fix that. But um, <clears throat> if it actually embolizes, then, then it's a problem. It has to be removed from wherever it embolizes to. Fortunately, that's really rare. Yes. Thank you for that lecture. Having been mentored by a, a Dr. Juicy who had the best med side manner of any of the cardiologists 50 years ago, <laughs> I appreciate your being here today. And uh, we had a patient who referred for ablation procedure for recurrent atrial fibrillation. He, uh, he had several uh, uh, cardioversions, but they didn't take. Every time he got angry, and, and he had plenty of that adrenaline surge, <laughs> having been the champion bull rider in the country last <laughs> year. But uh, every time he got angry, he developed atrial fib again. And so after the uh, ablation procedure, he still had another one or two uh, requiring another cardioversion. What is your experience in, in recurrent, and, and when, does it, when does it start to take and how long does it last? It, it, it's a really good question, and it's really variable is, is the answer. Um, in, um, for most atrial arrhythmias, uh, for um, supraventricular tachycardia or atrial flutter, ablation is 90 plus percent effective, is, is really good. For atrial fibrillation, it's uh, maybe 70 percent effective. And the question is, what's the definition of effective? That's like a one year, the freedom from atrial fibrillation. And uh, so it, the, the success rate is variable. Some people do have recurrences and do better with a second ablation. There are different ways of ablating. You can use cold therapy, cryotherapy. That doesn't seem to be quite as effective as the radio frequency. And so there may be a difference in technique as well. But it's... Uh, um, it's, it's a frustrating disease because it does tend to recur. Are there any other questions? I have a question uh, about indications for the watchman. Um, it seemed on the slides that you showed that the efficacy might be a little bit better um, than Coumadin and that bleeding is lower. So what is it, as a cost issue? Why not just do this with uh, more with people? With everybody. The, if you look at, and I didn't spend a lot of time with that slide, the efficacy of preventing uh, ischemic strokes, which are the embolic strokes, is, is maybe not quite as good as, as warfarin. It's not better anyway. Okay. Um, its main advantage is, is you don't have to take the anticoagulant, so you avoid the bleeding complications and, and hemorrhagic strokes. And I, I think. I think as it evolves and is, and it's not zero complications putting it in. It's it's low, but it's not, you know, no com, no procedure has has no complications. I think as as the procedure gets better and the devices get better, this is sort of the first generation. I think it probably will be much more widely used, particularly in people that have had any type of problems with anticoagulation. We recently had a youngish 58-year-old female with left main disease who uh, had a standard type of cabbage and then was unresponsive after, had a massive stroke, basically, diabetic, uh, Asian. And so that made me look into other things like, you know, how much better is surgery versus stenting? And are we at non-inferiority? Or maybe should she have had a minimally invasive, uh, non where they don't stop the heart and they don't go on the pump type of thing? Can you comment on those things? Sure. I you know, and this has been a question ever since angioplasty came along. And our, our, the best data we have now is, is uh, in patients with multivessel disease and diabetes, surgery is still superior in terms of mortality. Um, uh, you know, statistically significant, whether that's, you know, it, it, um, most patients don't want surgery. They'd rather have three or four cents put in, uh, but, it, but it's clear. Um, and that's mostly on the basis of recurrent, the need for recurrent, uh, because if you have three or four cents, one of them might go bad and, o over the next year or so. Um, but there actually is a mortality benefit to surgery in that, in that subgroup. Um, it also depends on how severe the disease is. There's, uh, there's ways of grading uh, the severity of disease based on the number of, of disease vessels, uh, how, where they are, and, and so on. And, 
and the higher the severity risk, the, the better patients do with surgery compared to, uh, compared to stenting. For the low or intermediate risk patients, stenting is clearly just as good. Yeah, the, many, uh, there, there's not a lot of data on minimally invasive or off-pump uh, surgery. There, there's just not enough data to say whether it's better or worse or, or, or the same. Well, thank you again, Dr. Juicy, for your uh, sharing, your experience and uh, expertise, and we really appreciate that. <laughs>